Well, good morning, everyone. Good to see you all this morning. Good to be worshiping with, here with you. Thank you to those of you who are joining us online. I hope that everybody had a great Thanksgiving in whatever way you chose to celebrate it and wherever you celebrated it. My wife and I, we had Thanksgiving at our sibling's house, uh, my sibling's house in Muskegon, and we had a, a great time, a little bit less dramatic than last year. Um, I don't know if I've told a few of you already, but uh, last year for our first uh, Thanksgiving that we hosted as a married couple, we actually had our Thanksgiving table uh, break on us after the meal. So uh, this year was a lot less dramatic. Uh, I think the only thing of note that happened was that me and my brother got into an eating contest, which in hindsight was probably a bad idea. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, you may ask who won. My brother isn't here today, so I think I can with confidence say that I won without any, uh, anyone disputing that. So. <laughs> Your brother wouldn't like that very no, well. no, he wouldn't. <laughs> Anyways, I hope you all had a great holiday um, and that you actually took some time to, uh, to remember the Lord and remember some things you're thankful to God for. So before we get to our message this morning, let's just open up with some prayer. Father, as we turn the corner on another Thanksgiving... We know that it's so easy to let that gratitude that we felt this week kind of just pass by, slip through our fingers, with, and just move on to the next big thing in our calendar. Lord, we know there are so many distractions out there that are tugging at our attention at all times and, and take us away from you and lead us into temptation. At the same time, Lord, we recognize that this season of Advent that's coming upon us that it's also a reminder of the powerful gift that you have given us in your son, Jesus Christ. There are just so many things about his death and his resurrection that have changed each one of us for the better. And we could spend all day worshiping you for those incredible changes that you've worked in our lives. For right now, we just want to offer some thanks to you for everything that you've done for your mercy and for your grace in having saved us from, from our own sin and from our own destructive lifestyle. We thank you for welcoming, welcoming us into your household as your children. As we turn to your word now, I pray that uh, you would speak into our lives through the message and that you would teach us all what you want us to learn. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, the season of Advent has come upon us. I feel like it snuck upon me. I, I feel like every year we kind of get to the December or at the very end of November, and I'm like, where did the time go? Uh, I, I always miss Black Friday because, uh, I don't know, I'm in a food coma or something from Thanksgiving. But uh, Advent is a, is a really important time for us in, in churches because it's an opportunity for us to remember the birth of our Savior. And so we wanted to take some time uh, over the next few weeks and kind of just look at Advent, look at some different ways in which uh, we, we, can, we can be appreciating the gifts that Jesus has given us. Because, you know, in, during Christmas time, there's a lot of focus on this idea of giving gifts to other people. We like to give gifts. We like to receive gifts. I love getting gifts for Christmas. But it's important to recognize that the greatest gift was already given to us by, by God himself, so, and that was through, through Jesus. So we're going to be looking at different topics in Advent, different gifts that Christ has given us uh, through, through his birth. And so the first, our first uh, gift we're going to talk about this week, i turn this on, is that of hope. And Steve already kind of introduced us a little bit to hope. But this is something that I think we're all familiar with, right? We all hope for things in life. For some of us, we might hope for a certain kind of Christmas gift that we're expecting to get this year. Some of us, we hope for new opportunities in life. Maybe you're hoping to meet that special someone, or uh, you're maybe hoping to have children or grandchildren coming up. You might be hoping that God would heal you from a specific illness or rescue you from some kind of looming disaster, whether it's financial or otherwise. I think if we really were to stop a moment and think about it, there's, all, there's something that we can say that we're hoping for right now, today, in the Advent season, this month, this year. Hope is something that we're very familiar with. And yet, 
I feel like sometimes we treat hope almost like it's probability or it's something that's up to chance. I mean, I think about it, and how often do we use hope? I might say something like, well, man, I hope it's going to be 70 degrees tomorrow. Prob- probably won't. <laughs> Spoiler alert. But, uh, I mean, we say that oftentimes. I-, I hope that this person will do this for me tomorrow. Or I hope that God would rescue me from this particular situation. And that is, I guess, the one, one of the problems with the English language. We-, we kind of double up with meaning sometimes. But when we turn to Scripture and we were celebrating the gift of hope that's given to us through Jesus, it's a very different kind of hope. The definition, I would say, is, is pretty far from how we use it today. So this morning, we're going to be looking at hope in Scripture. And we're going to be doing that by looking at a specific story uh, in the Gospel of Luke. So if you have your Bibles, feel free to turn to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, and we're going to be in verse 5. Luke is the third gospel, third book of the New Testament. And again, as we're, as we're going through this text and as we're reading it, it, be thinking about hope. What does hope really mean? All right, starting in Luke 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing upon the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. Let's just stop there for a moment. This is the kind of first major story in the Gospel of Luke. And I have to say, this is a really incredible story in so many ways. What's interesting to me is that when we talk about Advent, the birth of Christ, three out of the four Gospels don't start with Christ's birth, or it doesn't, they don't start with uh, you know, Joseph and Mary and the, the prophesied birth. They start with this guy, John the Baptist, first and foremost. And Luke even goes a step further, and he doesn't start with John the Baptist. He starts with the people before John the Baptist, his parents. And I think there's a really important reason for that. It has to do with hope. And we're going to talk about that this morning, that this particular story that we're going to read, it seems kind of odd on its face, but it's actually a major turning point in Scripture. And it represents kind of a new, like, there's like a new tone that's going to be set in the New Testament. And it's bringing a new sense of hope that we haven't seen before in Scripture. So, just kind of a little bit of background knowledge of the story. If you remember your Jewish history, Israel at this point is not their own nation. They were their own nation for a period of time under the kings, but then they were taken away to Babylon, eventually Persia, and then they were allowed to return. And if you read through the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, they had come back to the land the Israelites, and they had, uh, they had rebuilt the temple, they had rebuilt the wall, they had recommitted themselves to the Lord, and things seemed to be going pretty well at first. But then by the end of the book of Nehemiah, you start to see that kind of those old sins that the people had said they wouldn't do again, well, they started to do again. And then you see some uh, the, the last Old Testament prophets kind of showing up on the scene and trying to encourage the people to stay the course. And then you, like, you get to a book like Zechariah and you see an apocalyptic, uh, kind of an apocalyptic scene where J- Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. And then you get to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and it's just full of condemnation towards people who are kind of falling back into sin and falling back into corruption, specifically the leadership. And then after that, there's silence. And this silence lasted for centuries. 
Hundreds of years ran by. There's no new books written in the Old Testament. There's no scripture that has come out. The prophets, by and large, just vanish. And there's just silence. And I know God is probably working in the hearts and minds of many people there, but we just don't have the records of that. And there's nothing that the Holy Spirit has put on our plates as his church in terms of a message from that time. Now, historically, Israel went through a rocky road after this. They were, they were conquered by another, another nation. Uh, the, the leader of that nation came into the temple. He burned a pig on the altar, ignited a huge civil war. The Israelites fought back and against all odds. They, they beat the, this greater power. They regained the nation for themselves. Things seemed on the up and up, and then they were crushed again by the Roman Empire within a century. I think it was 60 or 80 years. And here they are now at the start of our story. They're, they're down, they're, their spirits are down. They're crushed under the heel of the Roman oppression. They aren't, you know, they have to be very careful about how they worship and what they worship. It's a time of great darkness for Israel here. And there's silence from God. And that's kind of where our story picks up this morning. And we have two characters that kind of are presented right off the bat. We have a guy named Zechariah and we have a person named Elizabeth. And what I think is really interesting is the text kind of paints them as just very good people. Zechariah is in the priesthood. He's a man of God. And, you know, his lineage there, he's from that, like, uh, clan of Abijah. And, and, you know, Elizabeth can trace her roots back to Aaron. These people are p- people who have a pure lineage that go all the way back. They, they're good, moral, upright people, too. And yet, even they have problems. They're struggling because Elizabeth is barren. And more than that, she's also old. In this culture, to have children meant everything. That was kind of the status symbol for for that time. I mean, nowadays, you know, we have fancy cars, you know, I don't know, Mercedes. I I don't know cars very much. But, you know, we have these status symbols like fancy cars, big houses, and things like that. Back then, children were an important status symbol. And the fact that Zechariah and Elizabeth didn't have any, that was, that's a, kind of a mark against them in, in, in their culture. They had to deal with shame for that, specifically Elizabeth. And they had gotten to the point where they look and they can, can't see that changing at all because she's too old to have children. And they're praying about it. And up until now, there's been no answer And this is where our story picks up. It's, it's, it seems just like it's a typical Tuesday night, maybe, Wednesday night. Uh, Zechariah's in the temple. He's sacrificing incense. He's his duty as a priest. There's something about a lot that's thrown in there. That's just kind of, there were so many priests at that time that you kind of cycled through every day was a different priest. It's his day to be in the temple. It's his time to burn incense. And uh, suddenly... All of a sudden, after centuries of silence, God speaks. And his message is about to begin something incredible that will change the history of the world from here on out. I think Isaiah 9-2 puts it best when he says that the people who are walking in darkness are about to see a great light. Have you ever felt like Zechariah in your own life? In, In a similar way, at least? yearning for something that, uh, you know, that you really, really want that's good to happen in your life. I mean, I I know I do. I mean, I think back, I even think right now some things that I'm yearning for. I'm yearning to find a house for myself that is affordable and still of good quality. To start, to start, I guess, my life in a way. I'm yearning in the future to have kids and to have a family. Those things God hasn't put on our plate right now yet. But I think I I can understand at least a little bit of where Zechariah is coming from here. And sometimes when we pray to God and and we seek him out, all we hear or what we perceive to hear is silence from that. There's no answer yet. And I know that's hard. It's a hard place to be. But I think my first point this morning is what we find in Scripture. And that's that out of silence... God oftentimes brings us hope. Mm-hmm. 
That's what we see in our story this morning. God just doesn't leave us in silence. He didn't leave Zechariah in silence, praying for something, and just said, you'll never know. He doesn't leave Israel in silence to a fate of just fading away and in, in, in being ignored. He doesn't ignore us forever. And he doesn't let us just sit in despair. And I, I don't know why sometimes it seems like he waits. But I know we can trust him to make things right. And we talked about that last month. I mean, when we went through the book of Psalms and how there's like this cycle of lament where we call out to God and cry out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then the very next week, we came back to Thanksgiving and that when God answers that prayer, we can look back and say, thank you, God, for answering that. So I guess here's one application of the text of hope that we see so far is don't give up. God gives us that gift of hope, even when it seems like it's the most dark. Israel was probably at one of the darkest eras in their history, and God spoke out of that silence, out of that darkness, and he brought light with him. Don't forget that. So back in our story, what message does God bring to Zechariah? Well, let's take a look at verse 13. Verse 13 tells us, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine nor, or strong, nor strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah and turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Wow. This is an incredible message that God brings forth. After years of silence, he comes to Zechariah and says, okay, I'm answering your prayer. You will have a son, even though it is impossible by medical science, by common sense, someone who's barren and old is gonna have a child. But for God, all things are possible. And he says, this will happen. And more than that, that son that you're gonna have, he's not just gonna be, you know, joy for you, but he's going to do something great for the nation of Israel. He's going to do something that hasn't been seen in centuries. And in fact, has probably has never been seen ever. He has the power and spirit of Elijah, the greatest of the prophets. And he's going to turn people to the Lord. He's going to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. See, it's not just about meeting Zechariah's hope. God here starts to meet the hope for the people of Israel. The promises that were made in all of the prophets of the coming one who would make all things right and who would lead the people. In this moment, we see that despite whatever happens, despite Zechariah's future doubts, God here is going to make it happen. And he said it will be so, and so it will. And that's, I think, one of the most incredible parts about this text is that what God says will happen. And that hope is not just a hope of, well, maybe God will do this, but God says it is going to happen. So here's my second point this morning. Hope is anchored in God's plan. What I mean by that is that when we talk about hope sometimes, it is probable. Well, I hope that this will happen. I hope that will happen. When we hope in God, that, that is something that will happen. And we see that in Scripture. And we see this again and again throughout all the Old Testament. Look at the promises to Abraham, the story that, that was there. And we won't turn there, but you can look back on your own time and just see how God met his promise to Abraham in providing uh, descendants that would be greater than the, the number of stars in the sky and that, would, uh, that through him all the nations of the world would, would be blessed. We see that in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. 
Look at Israel learning or yearning to be free from the yoke of Egypt. God met that. He provided hope for them, and that hope came to pass. Look at how he delivered Israel through the judge, through the book of Judges, through First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Chronicles. Look at his words through the prophets. Everything that he says he will do, he does. And so when we hope in God, we are not disappointed. We can look to the word of God for hope. And when he says it, it has been fulfilled and it will be fulfilled, we can trust him in that. So what was Zechariah to hope for exactly? Well, he's hoping for a son, but more importantly, he's looking forward to the, uh, the, what he's going to accomplish. When he's hoping, when he's looking forward in hope, he's also looking forward to the words of, of this angel saying he's going to do great things. And, he, and the text says that John will be bringing Israel to a place where they will be a people prepared. Well, here's my question. What are they being prepared for? And again, this small hope of Zechariah is hinting at a much, much larger hope. John is coming for a reason. He's coming to prepare Israel for someone who's even greater than him, and that's the Lord Jesus. I think we see a great picture of kind of what hope looks like to us if we turn to the book of Colossians. So if you, have, if you want to flip over to Colossians really quick, Feel free to do so. I'm going to have it up on the screen. But in the book of Colossians, Paul is, is speaking to the, to the church, and he has this to say. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. He says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body that is the church, of which, became I, which, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God, that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. And here's the important part. He's here to make the, God, the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What we're hoping for, the whole reason why we hope is right here. We're hoping for Christ in us. And that's what John the Baptist was there to prepare, prepare the way for Christ to come to earth and to do what he was there to do for our sake. The real reason why we hope and we look forward in anticipation to something was this hidden mystery that was only hinted at in the Old Testament. What I find absolutely just fascinating is if you read through the Old Testament, you don't see a lot of uh, talk about the afterlife. It feels like the people are so concerned with the life that they have right now that they don't even think about what comes beyond that. And I know that's, not, that's an oversimplification, but we don't see a lot of, of hoping for what happens after death in the Old Testament. It's, it was hidden. It was like a mystery to those people. What happens to us if we're righteous and we, and we follow God's commands? It was concealed from them. But in the New Testament, in, in Colossians, in Luke, we see the contents of that mystery. We see that suddenly there's a greater picture for us. There's something that we're looking forward to in hope. And I love that Steve brought this up today because we're looking forward now to eternity. And that eternity is with Christ, our Savior. That is an incredible thing to hope for. And Colossians hits it right when he says, the hope is of glory. Now, when I think about glory, I think about God and how glorious he is. And our hope is to be alongside him in that glory. Uh, another passage that if you want to turn to is Romans. We're going to look at Romans chapter 8 very quickly. So I don't have this on slides. So uh, either you can look it up in your scriptures or 
uh, just kind of listen along. Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 18, we'll be reading. And in this text, Paul talks a little bit about that future glory that we're hoping for and what that means and what we can look forward to and anticipate thanks to what Christ has done for us on the cross. Romans 8, verse 18, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time... Yeah. For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain, obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for adoption as sons and the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Such an incredible picture of what we hope for. We hope for the redemption of our bodies. We hope for the redemption of creation, creation to be set free from its shackles. We look forward to our full adoption as sons and daughters of God to be in the presence of the Lord and his glory eternally. Again, this was only, this was only accomplished thanks to what Christ has done. Again, you look at the Old Testament, they had no inkling of this. Well, maybe a little inkling. I think there's a few texts in the, in the New Testament that kind of hint. I think there's a text in 1 Peter that, uh, that kind of hints at that, that they're, uh, if, you're, if you're taking notes, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, and John 8, 56 are two texts that help to hint at like, they could, they could kind of see it, but they couldn't see it fully. In the Old Testament, they didn't have that hope to be with God eternally. But thanks to what Christ has done, that's what we're looking forward to. So here's my next point this morning, and this is really, I think, the main point of, of my message this morning. Our hope in Jesus Christ is secure. And again, we talked about this already, that hope, sometimes we say, eh, it may come to pass, it may not. Not our hope in Jesus. Not our hope of being with God eternally. That is secure, and there's nothing that can shake that. It is a gift from Christ, thanks to his birth, his death, and his resurrection. We have a living hope. I think, as 1 Peter 1.3 says. I think that's just incredible. So kind of to return back to our story, how did Zechariah and Elizabeth respond to this? Flip back to Luke, and we're going to look at verse 18 to kind of see how they responded to this message of hope. In, in this time. And I just love the, the juxtaposition between these two characters, uh, these two people. Let's look at verse 18. Verse 18 says, And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him and said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived... And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. 
I just love those two responses. We have Zechariah who is given this hope saying, you will bear a, you know, your, your wife will bear a son and, this, and this, this prophet will lead Israel to a place where they will be prepared for the coming of the Lord. And his response is, you gotta be joking me. You gotta be kidding me, really? Prove it. He says to the angel of the Lord who he, just a few minutes ago, he was flat on his face in fear. I'd like to think, you know, I, th- I feel like when we read stories like this, I, I often think like, oh man, I would never do that. I'd never be that guy. I'd, I'd, I would be like, yes, yes, sir, angel, Mr. Gabriel. But I feel like if I were to really think about it, I would probably be just in the same boat as Zechariah. You gotta be kidding me, really? This thing that was impossible is now gonna happen? I might even think I was dreaming. I'd say, you know, just prove to me that I'm not dreaming. Pinch, pinch me. You know, Gabriel, make, you know, am I dreaming? Elizabeth, though, on the other hand, Zechariah responds with disbelief. He asks for a sign. And I feel like the angel kind of gives him a sign. He kind of says, okay, you wanted to proof? Well, here's proof. You're not going to be able to speak. It's a little bit of a sense of humor there. But Elizabeth, on the other hand, I think reacts very differently. She reacts with kind of a sense of humility and joy. I mean, can you imagine what she had to go through? Here she is, old and old and advanced in years. She thought her dream, what she wanted for her life, would never happen. And then suddenly, it's happened. She's already accepted that perhaps she won't have kids. And I know she's praying here, and both of them are praying for this miracle to happen. But it still must have been incredibly shocking for her. And how does she respond? She responds by kind of praising the Lord in a way. And I know it's kind of, it's hard to see that in the text. It says, thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach from among people. He's, she's given it right back to God. And I think that's just incredible. And it's changed her life. I mean, you think about it, you know, what, what would she have to look forward to at this point? She's looking forward to death maybe. You know, she's old and she's, she has nothing really outside of taking care of her husband. All of a sudden now she has to look forward to raising a son. It's an incredible, incredible gift that God has given her. So here's my fourth point. Responding to God with hope leads to newness of life. Elizabeth was hoping and looking forward to this birth, and it changed her life. You kind of see from this point on, she's excited about what's coming up ahead. I think that's just incredible. But the story doesn't end here. They actually kind of, we have this huge uh, kind of, I wouldn't say side, it's not a tangent. It's actually kind of the main story. But Luke eventually circles back to the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Flip over a page or two to verse 57. Verse 57 of Luke chapter 1. We kind of pick up with the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Verse 57 says, Now the time for Elizabeth, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy on her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, No, he shall be called John. And they said to her, None of your relatives are called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet, and he wrote, His name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened, and his tongue loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors. And all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid up in their hearts, saying, What what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. The response of Zechariah and Elizabeth in hope is remarkable. How did they respond to the hope that was given to them? Hope led to worship. That's the conclusion of our story. We see Elizabeth had already kind of worshipped God. Then we see the people rejoicing and celebrating the birth of this child. And then we see finally Zechariah, the minute that his tongue was loosed, he blesses God. Hope leads to worship. It leads to blessing. 
For us today, when we think about Advent, how Christ's coming brings us the hope of glory in the future, there's nothing that we can do except just respond by blessing the Lord, by celebrating him in worship. It's like we, when we receive an incredible Christmas gift, when you get like that gift that tops all gifts. I remember one time uh, my, my wife, she was my girlfriend at the time, she gave me, we had a gift war kind of between us. We were trying to like one-up each other with like getting really good gifts. She eventually got a gift that was so impressive and big that I didn't know what to do. She actually bought me a, a, a whole trip to go somewhere and I'd never traveled before. It was incredible. I remember the, the only thing I could say was thank you. Thank you so much. That, I, I, I can't express how much this means to me. And that's what we can do with God today. We can express our gratitude. We can bless the Lord and we can worship. And we'll get an opportunity to do that in just a few minutes uh, when, we, when we sing one final song. So, in conclusion, our hope in Christ is assured. There is nothing that can stop God's plan. And so we can rest in that hope. We can look forward to what Christ has done or what Christ will do for us, and we can celebrate that Christ is already inside of us if we believe in him. In some ways, our hope has already been met, and we're just waiting for kind of the end cap, the, the, the coda, because Christ already lives inside of us. We can rejoice and we can bless the Lord for what he has done for us. And when he calls us home, we can look forward to that day. And we can look forward to the day that the Lord returns again in glory. So do you hope for that day? Do you look forward in hope? Do you long for it? Do you take encouragement from it? In, in the midst of our chaotic and busy lives, I feel like that's one thing that we can, that, that is constant, that we can rest in. And that no matter what else happens, we can still look forward to that place with hope. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. God, this morning we thank you for the message of hope from your gospel, that you speak out of the silence, and that and it is for our good. We thank you that you have brought Christ to earth, that you prepared a way for him through John the Baptist, that you delivered us from our sin through what the acts of Jesus on the cross. We thank you that he lives in us today and that we have a hope for glory for the future of living alongside you, having our bodies the way that they should be, the way that they were originally meant to be. We thank you for that living hope that we have through Jesus. And we pray that you would encourage us in that every day of our lives, not only in Advent, but even beyond. Encourage us in these truths and spark in us a heart full of joy and blessing as a response. We ask this in the name of Jesus, the one in us. Amen. Please stand.